let's finish up the third chapter of The Pearl of the Soul of the World, which is called Weasel Hounds. Um, our main character and the female Duro have returned to the camp to only to find it destroyed. Snarls and cough-like barking, the scratch of boots on sand, and the grunt of men hard-pressed quickened Maruha's pace to a hurtling run. She dragged the pale girl after her down the wide white corridors, a jumping lamp flame and shadows on the wall around a sharp turn in the, tu in the tunnel made the Duro catch her breath. Rounding the corner, she dropped the uplander's hand. The girl stumbled to a halt. They stood at the junction of several corridors. All looked old and unused. The masonry of the arches crumbling. She saw Colum and Brandle with their backs to a blank stretch of wall, cornered by the snapping, snarling creatures that crouched sinuously before them. Brandle had a short sword, Colum a hollow dirk like the one Maruha had. Both men wore finger lamps, holding them high for light and occasionally driving their attackers with fire instead of blade. Driving back their attackers with fire instead of blade. The creatures had cornered the creatures that had cornered them were large and white with stubby legs, two before, two behind, with an extra pair at mid body. Their blunt snouts emitted a dog like coughing. Patches of black masked their fierce red eyes and tipped their long, thick, tapering tails. They traveled low to the ground, their bodies so long that they that they humped in the middle. Their gait was an odd fluid undulation, deceptively agile. There were nearly a dozen of them. The upperlander recoiled. Weasel hounds, cried Maruha softly, part of the witch's brood. Flinging off her packs, she rushed forward and stung one of the creatures from behind with her dirk. It turned like a whiplash to snap at her. Maruha stung it again across the muzzle. It shrank away, scratching its mask with long nailed paws. The pale girl stood mesmerized, not daring to move. Before her, too hard pressed to look up, Colum and Brandle seemed not to have noticed Maruha yet. One weasel hound leapt and caught hold of Brandle's sleeve. He brought her finger lamp down on its skull with a crack. The white creature released its grip, but the impact had jarred loose the lamp. It fell to the floor and went out. One of the beasts seized it in his jaws and slung it away. Colum cursed. He drove his hollow dirk into the neck of one of the animals as it lunged for his leg. The creature gave a yip and sprang back, shaking its head. Then it stumbled and sank. Two of its fellows dragged its still form out of their path and plunged across at the Duro's men, at the Duro men. The weasel hound, Maruha had stung, now lay still as well. Maruha! Colum looked up in startled disbelief. His joy quickly vanished. It's no good, there are too many. Save yourself, Brandle shouted above the glow, above the growling. We'll hold them as long as we can. I will not. Maruha flung back, kicking one of the weasel hounds in the ribs so that it turned and pricked itself upon her poison dagger. It sprang away with a yelp, its fellows aware of the Dura women now, of the Dura woman now, turned on her. Run, Maruha, it's hopeless, cried Brandle. He stumbled backward into Colum beneath the furious onslaught of two of the hounds. Colum lost his footing in the fallen masonry. As his arm struck the cave wall, his lamp too went out. All three of them gasped, as though expecting to be plunged into darkness, but the cool, steady light of the pearl now filled the chamber. The Duros looked up, and the weasel hounds turned suddenly, all of them, to stare. The pale girl stood shaking. The witch's creatures terrified her, yet they seemed arrested by her light. Unsteadily, she reached into her garment and drew out the pearl, so that its warm glow might shine more strongly. The pin behind her ear pricked warmly, but the red eyes of the weasel hounds frightened her more than the prospect of pain. The light, she realized, would hold them at bay. As if sensing her defiance, the pin bit down viciously until she gasped, but she refused to return the jewel to its hiding place. Gritting her teeth, the upper lander held up the pearl. Circling, watching her every move, the witch's beasts began to yip and howl. They cowered before the pearl's dim blue light. Maruha stabbed, too, with her poisoned dirk before they slunk snarling into the nearest of the tunnels. Colum and Brandle stood open-mouthed, though the pain intensified with every step. The girl, focused, the girl forced herself to follow the weasel hounds, hurting them. Whining and snapping, the witch's brood retreated farther down the hall. Drawing his pick, Colum sprang into the pile of rubble that lay to one side of the tunnel's collapsing arch. Barely short of the entryway, the pale girl halted, panting with the effort of defying the pin and gazing after the snapping hounds that milled and paced just beyond the first intensity of the light. 
column struck the keynote of the arch. Get back, girl, Brandel cried, rushing forward. Above them, the arch collapsed with a roar. The upper lander clutched the pearl to her as Brandel shoved her clear. She lay on the hard ground a moment then, her head still one great throbbing ache. Choking, the young Duro held his sleeve over his nose. Column threw a handful of something into the air, and in a moment, the dust abruptly settled. From the other side of the rubble, the girl heard the weasel hounds gargling and digging. Bruised and shaken, she straightened. Brandel picked himself up, still staring at her. What is that light? What is that light? That jewel she carries. Maruha shook her head. Colum was kneeling beside her, examining a wound on his wrist. The sleeve was bloody, torn. It's nothing, she told him, and pulled away. Then to Brandel, I know not but it can be nothing which made that I vow, since her creatures shun it. She knelt, rekindling finger lamps, handing Brandle his harp and calling his pack. Do you still think she must be one of the witches? She demanded tartly. The bearded Darrow flushed. I know not what, to, what she is, he answered at last, but I know she has saved us this day. Brandle put up his short sword and stowed, his, and stowed the harp. He glanced uneasily at the, the new-made wall. That's not the last long against these cults. That'll not last long against their claws. Shaking, the upper lander put away the pearl. The pain in her head did not subside. Angrily, she stood. She was tired of this blankness of memory and the torment of the pin, tired of being terrorized and controlled. Who was she? How had she come here? She needed answers. Wincing, she ignored the pain and surveyed the scene around her. The concussion of the tumbling arch had shaken loose other stones as well. The blank wall against which Cullum and Brandel had made their stand was cracked now with a spider web of fissures. Near the, stealing, near the ceiling, a stab of plaster had sheared away to reveal a great starburst carved into the stone. It occurred to the pale girl that most of this wall might be plaster, not stone at all. But which part, Maruha was saying, if weasel hounds are afoot, you can be sure all paths hereabouts are overrun with them. The girl moved nearer, drawn to the starburst. The pin throbbed even more fiercely, but furiously she disregarded the signal to retreat. As she lifted one finger to touch the starburst, the fissure below, its deepen below it deepened, and a crumbling brick of dried clay fell with a thunk, leaving a hole in the wall. Darkness and emptiness lay beyond, and the scent of stale air. Colin was fishing for the map in his sark. Unfolding it, he and Maruha bent over it. The pale girl grimaced, as the pin twisted down, defiantly, she pulled another brick from the wall. This way leads to other paths. As do these, the Dura women muttered. They could lead to weasel hounds as well. With growing determination, the girl dug more bricks from the opening. The pain was nearly blinding now, but she kept on. Despite the heavy cost, she found that thwarting the pin brought her an immense satisfaction. Though it could still torture her, the witch's weapon no longer possessed her will. The wall's opening was now wide enough to admit the upper lander's head and shoulders. Leaning through, she felt a sudden peace washing over her. Better than food or drink or rest, she halted, stunned as the pin behind her ear abruptly ceased. Before her, the pearl's light revealed a very broad, straight corridor stretching away into the distance. The walls were carved with figures of duros and machines. Whatever path we take, let us take it quickly, Brandel behind her was urging. Carefully, the pale girl glanced around. As she removed her head from the opening, she knew the pain of the pin would not, would return. His back to her, Brandel, his back to her, Brandel eyed the shifting rubble of the rock fall nervously. The growling of the weasel hounds and the sound of their digging on the other side grew more vigorous. Colin bent over his finger lamp, trimming the wick. Neither of them took no, any notice of the girl. No path is safe, Maruha told them, rattling the map one-handed in exasperation and nursing her wounded arm. We must clo we must choose one and go. Without another moment's hesitation, the upper lander turned from the duros and crawled through the opening into the, adjo into the adjoining corridor. Here, she wanted to call. Here lay the path they must take. But the pin still prevented her from speaking, even if it could no longer cause her pain. The ceiling overhead rose beyond her reach. The carvings ran in a long, narrow band along either wall. The shadow would never find her there. She was certain of it. Faintly behind her, she heard Brandel cry out, Where's the girl? Maruha gave a shout. Their voices sounded remote, like words whispered into a copper bowl. Curses. The sound of bustling. 
She was just standing there, Brandel started, then look! Exclamations, murmuring silence. A false wall! This was Maruha. Boost me up, Colum, so I can see. Scrabbling, the girl turned to glimpse the Dura woman staring at her through the hole. She smiled at Maruha, trying to show them by her expression what she could not put into words. What a miraculous place this was. Her serene feeling of contentment grew. They would all find what they were seeking here, if not quite here, then somewhere very close at hand. Perhaps at the end of the corridor, Maruha vanished, a frantic rattling of the parchment. That's Ravenna's path, Colum was exclaiming. One of the pilgrims roads to the city of Crystal Glass. See, it's marked here on the map. It must have been walled off when the city was sealed. It's very wide and straight with beautiful carving along the walls. The girl's in there, Maruha. Let's follow her then, Randall hissed. And seal it after us, quick, before the hounds break through. We can hide there until they move on. Scrambling again, the youngest girl wriggled through the hole and dropped to the ground with a breathless with a breathless oof. He glanced at the girl, who smiled radiantly back. He stared a moment, obviously puzzled, then shook his head as if too pressed to wonder at it now. But she noted a trace of a smile beginning to tug at his own lips, as though he too were starting to feel the strange tranqui tranquility of the pilgrim's road. Picking himself up and turning to stand on toes, he called cheerfully back to Maruha and Colum, Pass me the bricks and the packs! Smiling still, the pale girl turned away from him and wandered down the hall, aware of a gentle, inexorable tug pulling her on. A call, sweet, eerie euphoria, continued to steal over her. She ran her fingers along the wall carvings, small, squat figures like herself, and occasionally one very much taller than the rest, human-shaped, but strangely garbed. They all meant nothing to her. But she felt sure now that all her questions would be answered if only she could discover the source of that which summoned her. Behind her, Cullum had boosted Maruha through the crack and let her pull him after, pull him up after. The two of them stood furiously, shoving clay bricks back into place, while Brandel, grinning ecstatically, himself now examined in, exclaimed in wonder, holding his fingertip up before the freeze. The girl kept moving farther and farther from the false wall in the Duros. No, wait, it's no good, Brandel cried suddenly, his smile washing away. The hounds will know we're in here. They'll follow our scent. Not if we confuse their senses, replied Maruha grimly. Glancing back, the upper lander saw her drawing from her sack a glass ampule. Brandel retreated swiftly. Kneeling on Colum's shoulders, Maruha shook the amber, shook the amber globe, then tossed it through the last brick hole. The girl glimpsed a, phosphorus fla a phosphorescent flash, Coughing and shielding her nose with her sleeve, Maruha shoved the last brick into place and jumped down. Colum guide, guided her after Brandel. Presently, a stink like rotten toadstools drifted past. Uninterested, the pale girl turned away. Come, the call reached out to her down the broad corridor. Come, and that is the end of chapter three.